हाय दोस्तों ब्राज ग्रुप के चैनल में आप सभी का स्वागत है ब्राज ग्रुप आपके लिए लाया एक नया लेसन आशा करता हूँ आप लोगों को पसंद आएगा धन्यवाद नो आई वांट टू एक्चुअली कंप्लीट पार्ट ऑफ द प्रीएम्बल एंड मूव ऑन टू आर्टिकल वन डे नाउ इन द प्रीएम्बल द वी स्पेंड अ कपल ऑफ क्लासेस लुकिंग एट इट आई जस्ट वांट टू बिगिन विद वन सो दैट आई कैन गो अहेड If you look at that word fraternity, which is where I think we stopped last time, we were looking at justice, we were looking at liberty, we were looking at equality. We noticed that words liberty, equality, fraternity coming to us really from uh, the French Revolution, and we also looked at uh, justice which is of course not there in the french revolution it's something that we placed very high up and it's come even above the liberty equality and fraternity because i think the freedom movement reflected the need for justice the need to do away with the and to create a more equal society so you can see the close links between equality and justice and next semester when we come to the chapter on fundamental rights i think we will see the conceptual relations between justice and equality greater i pointed out to you that while the french revolution of 1789 uh, underscored equality the americans in their declaration of independence drop that word equality and you will see that there is a definite need, reason why they drop equality because the growing capitalist economy was not very concerned with questions of equality but when you cut and come straight away to the mid 40s post second world war and all the constitutions that are there you will see that justice is now coming forward as a very great demand that is being put forward by all the newly emerging countries of asia africa and latin america and so justice has always been if you look at early uh, biblical thought justice has always been what was called a cardinal virtue prudence temperance fortitude and justice the four great cardinal virtues which highly celebrated in the bible as important virtues that we should have and in fact many uh, jurists for example uh, john rawls when he wrote his book theory of justice he said amongst all justice is the foremost value amongst all the social institutions that exist you know far more than liberty equality and fraternity and and i think that that thinking was very very strong the indian constitution is far prior to john rawls writing of his theory of justice uh, and uh, you know justice was given a pride of place now i come to fraternity and then you look fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual we were, i think we stopped there last class and the unity and integrity of the nation the 42nd amendment added these words unity and integrity now in my previous class i had mentioned to you that whether the preamble was to be a part of the constitution and if it was it was capable of amendment the keshwananda bharti case clearly told us that the preamble was a part keshwananda bharti case 1973 42nd amendment 1977 uh, sorry 1976 was the amendment it comes into force a few months later so in 3 years unity and integrity become an amended part of the preamble along with socialist and with secular socialist i have talked to you is part of the general economic justice secular again dealing with liberty if you have liberty of religion then as one of the other side of the coin also is secular but the indian version of secular is different from say uh, the secularization which happened in europe it is different from the american first amendment which calls the uh, the clear wall of separation between the state and religion because the indian constitution gives the individuals the right of freedom of religion the indian secularism also has its indianness imprinted on the way in which our courts 
interpret the word religion, uh, secular. So you can have, um, you know, so when you look at 25, 26, 27, 28, I don't have time to go into that, but there is also uh, Sarva Dharma Sambhava or wall of separation between state and religion. If the government or the state was equidistant with all religions, is that good enough? Or must it be completely divorced from all religions? And because of uh, this Dharma Nirpeksh rather than the wall of separation. Okay, fine. The second point that I would like to make in today's class is the ability to amend the constitution is makes one of the underlying implied parts of the constitution that each generation can amend the constitution as it deems fit. I pointed out to you, if the preamble is part of the constitution, well, you can amend it. But should the amendment be done by people now or should it be fixed and frozen in time as it originally was done? So if you look at uh, the debates, say, around the American Constitution. I'm mentioning this because some of you may be interested to read more. On the one hand, you had people Excuse like... Excuse me, ma'am. Yes? Uh, ma'am, I'm so sorry. Actually, there are many students in our class who are unable to join the uh, class right now. And the limit is full for this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> what can I do? Because we have so, that limit. Yes, ma'am. And there, there are, I think, 10 to 12 people from our class, section A. Oh. Oh, dear. So, what do I do? Adhruv, turn off your camera. Uh, ma'am, you can record the lecture and listen. I don't want to record because I have to take consent from each one of you. Ma'am, we are ready, ma'am. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, are they our section A students? Yes, ma'am. So, can I uh, record this lecture, please? Yes, ma'am. All the lectures, yes. please. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Are your other classes getting recorded? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Some of the uh, professors they record the class. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but I have to figure out how to record. record. Ma'am, on the screen itself, uh, at the uh, right uh, right corner uh, in the last, the three dots were the option, ma'am. Is he may is for recording the option. Just give me a moment, please. So now uh, what I find is uh, that ability to amend the constitution. If you take the American constitutional law, for example, you know, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, these are all, of course, well-known names that even we in India know. The debate had been about whether we should freeze the constitution as enacted or whether we should allow amendment or not. And often this is uh, described in terms of the anti-democratic feature of the constitution if you don't allow amendment. What do I mean by that? One, I can have amendment. If the amendment is done by a procedure which is similar to the making of a law, the usual word that we use is that it is a flexible constitution. It is an uncontrolled constitution. Flexible, because just like I can make a law with uh, whatever percentage of people present and voting, similarly I can amend a constitution. But if the constitution is very difficult to amend, we call it as a rigid constitution. For example, in some countries to amend the constitution, you need to have a full referendum. In India, it's not that difficult, but still it is 
uh, you know, on some things you need to get all the states if you're amending the federal parts. Otherwise, it's not just a simple majority, but a special majority to amend. I think as students of law, you're aware of that. That's the procedure. But in terms of the content, should each generation be permitted to amend the constitution or not? And the way that the debate has taken place in the U.S. was that as it will, then it's anti-democratic because you are not responding to the majority of people at each point in time. And you will find, for example, uh, you know, if you look at an article that actually Mr. Raju Ramachandran was a senior advocate of the Supreme Court, he examines this point with reference to the Keshwan and the Badris case. And he asks whether by putting a freeze on the kinds of amendment you can have, because this was the heart of the Keshwan and the Bhatti case. The government of the day, led by Mrs. Indira Gandhi, was saying that we as parliament have a power to amend. And if that is a power to amend, we can amend wherever and whatever and to whatever extent we wish of the constitution. Whereas the Supreme Court responded by its majority opinion in the in the Keshwan and the Bhatti case, that amend you can, but you cannot touch the basic structure. That is, there is an inviolable code which you cannot amend. And is this an undemocratic aspect of the basic structure doctrine? Because tomorrow, and uh, of course the Supreme Court was smart enough to leave play, it said, what is the basic structure we are not laying down? Each generation can decide and it would unfold. So they didn't give it a rigid architecture. There was a, a, a doctrine called the basic structure, basic feature, but that you cannot amend, rest of it you can amend. But it still begs the question whether by placing such limits on the amendability of the constitution, is it anti-democratic? Is it counter-majoritarian? If the bulk of the people want to change even the basic structure, should they not be allowed to? Should we allow the past to determine what is suitable for us today? So you can see the past and present, then and now kind of debate and why we call it anti-democratic as one of the aspects. That is a philosophical question that is asked, should there be limits placed on amendment or not? However, inserting the words unity and integrity of India is something that was not seen as offending and this has now become part of our constitution. Unity and integrity of India. So these words were never there in our constitution. Now let's begin with Article 1 today. Let's begin with Article 1 because it relates to what I have just now discussed. Look at Article 1. In my earlier class, I told you that the constitution is not like a normal piece of legislation. Normal piece of legislation, section 1 will be the short title. Yeah, please, if 10 people will go away, I'd be very happy and let section 8 come in. Okay, now... Uh, Normally, Section 1 is the short title. Section 2 is the territorial extent. Section 3 or 2, depending on the kind of law, will become the definition. But that's a very dull way in which a constitution, which is such a basic document, should begin or look like. And I think that when it, the framers of the constitution were very clear that those definitions, etc., should go away to the end. So, Article 366 is the definitional clause. Article 394 is the commencement clause. Okay, So those things went away to the end of the constitution. And look at how the constitution begins. Uh, I'm not going to make a link. Okay, I, I think uh, let me not now. Whoever wants to leave can leave. But if those who want to stay can stay. Okay, I'll address this in some other way next time. Look at the way Article 1 begins. India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. It begins with this most dramatic sentence. 
it is a declaration india comma that is bharat comma shall be a union of states now look at this first part of this india that is bharat now what should be the name of this country lots of debate in our constituent assembly constituent assembly debates are very useful to read it gives you a colorful picture of the kinds of discussions that had should it be hindustan okay now you know that one of the things about uh you know when the greeks came to india for example anybody to the east of the indus river to the east of the sindhu was somebody who lived in hindustan that is it has a territorial description hindustan being that which is where the hindus live those who are the is not religious point of view but more a territorial description so uh, 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 our first president dr s radhakrishnan he wrote a small book published by bharati vidya bhavan okay hinduism a way of life and the way he begins that little book is by talking about hindu sindhu indus and the territorial description of who is a hindu and you see very good reference to that in this judgment which is still the classic judgment on the point who is a hindu yagnya purush das ji versus mul das it's a brilliant judgment by justice gajendra gadkar in the early 60s until today it is the locus classicus on who is a hindu and he deals a great deal with dr radha krishnan's book so one of the issues in the constituent assembly debates was should we call this as hindustan okay yet the bulk of the opinion was that no let's not have it as hindustan india by that time was already the name by which british india was known okay government of india act so the british parliament was referring to this geographical colony as india british india princely india part a part b part c states of india in ever so many ways and starting from the government of india act 19 1858 british parliament has already re- referred to it as india so in the englishman's eyes it was india and therefore what was chosen was india that is bharat shall be the union of states but if you just went back at the end of the constitution again and you looked at the short title of our constitution look at article 393 can you just open your constitutions please and look at 393 what does it say here ma'am this constitution may be called as the constitution of india that's right so here it's being called as the constitution of india so the official title is still the constitution of india but article 1 begins by saying india that is bharat that is the country is known going to be known officially by two names india and bharat so the document is going to be called constitution of india and you can see that, that there is a difference this is the document that is the country shall be a union of states and so in today's class i am going to be focusing on why we chose union of india and in order to understand that a little historically i am going to look at two words one is a confederation and the other is a federation so before the constituent assembly we had three choices should we call it a union of states should we call it a confederation of states and do we call it a 
federation of states. And that brings me to the fourth word here, which is states. So let me just quickly run through what was in the mind of the Constituent Assembly and why we finally chose Union of States. If you take a country like the US, there were the 13 initial states that declared at the time of 1776 when the Declaration of Independence took place. Do you remember the, the Declaration of Independence after the American Civil War? These 13 states which are on the east, okay, so these would be states like Connecticut, Delaware, uh, Boston, all of the Massachusetts, sorry, not Boston, Massachusetts. All these 13 states that came together and declared themselves. Now, a confederation is a institution where previously independent sovereign states decide to come together and give away, through a contract, give away some of their rights to a central authority, which is the central authority over which each one of the confederating states have control. That is, a confederation has a central government, but that central government has been created by previously independent states giving away some of their powers and that central government always being subordinate to the original founding state. So the relationship would be hierarchical. You would have the initial previously independent states and then you would have a confederal government. And this is the way the United States operated from 1776 till 1787, nine years, with a confederation. Yet this confederation was clearly not enough because if you have a government which is always a delegate of a previously independent state, you will see that in the power relationships, the central government is at the mercy. At any time, a federation, a federal state can withdraw its powers. It would have no independent area of action. And therefore, between 1787, when the American constitution got adopted, and uh, the previous period till 1787, till finally, you know, came into effect in 1789, with all those ratifications. Anyway. So those, those two dates that I'm using, it became a federation. Now, what is a federation as opposed to a confederation? And I think as law students, we must be clear about the words we use and what it means. Now, in a federation, there is a definition of a federal principle, which you will have found, those of you who have read this judgment, there is a reference to Casey Weir, who is a very well-known constitutional theorist. And, uh, you know, in a period between, say, like 1940, 50, 60, he was the constitutional theorist who simply dominated the English-speaking world. And Casey Weir put forward a federal principle which he underlines all federations. And what he said is that a system of coordinate government power between center and state, as opposed to a subordinate relationship between confederal states and the central government, where center and states are co-equal. And both of them operate directly on citizens and both of them have the power to make laws which operate directly on citizens, then you have a federal system. That is, these federal system comes together when 10 um, when both center and state can make laws the central government and the state government are independent of each other. One is not deriving powers from another. The central power is independent, the state power is independent. Then we can call ourselves as a federation. So if you were to look, for example, in our constitution, the legislative power of the center is laid out in the seventh schedule in the 7th schedule in list 1. 
and this is independent of the state's power to legislate which is given in list 2 it is entirely another matter that there is also a list 3 that's not relevant to my discussion on federation compared to this when i go back to the earlier confederation point the legislative power of the central government between 1776 to 1787 when the united states was a confederation the power of the central government was completely dependent on the legislative powers which had been given to them by the confederal governments and which could have been taken back at any time that's not a federation this is a federation if as per case here you have independent spheres of power and both of them have the power to make laws independently on the citizens just as a counter example let me talk about the power of a panchayat or a municipality after the 73rd amendment the power to make laws has not been given to the panchayats panchayats have the power of the executive to implement the laws they have the power to implement and administer there is a devolution of administration there is no devolution of legislative power and as students of law who understand that there is a distinction between legislative power and administrative and executive power you can notice that in the panchayats there is a devolution of administrative powers it is a spelling mistake it's devolution okay. there is a devolution of administrative powers but law making powers is still shared by and large between the center and the states the only exception to this and i'm just mentioning it here if you don't follow what i'm saying don't get confused i'll come to that entirely in the sixth schedule certain amount of law making powers has been given to tribal councils in the sixth schedule states okay. otherwise legislative power is shared between the center and the state so that's true but federal power in kc where beneath is only dealing with the power to make laws the federal principle is confined to the test for that is legislation that's the reason that it doesn't violate purely kc where's principle however that's kc where who focused only on legislation okay so where am i the choice was whether to have a confederation that got ruled out because by definition a confederation forms a weaker central government do we have confederal constitution still in the world today do we have federal confederal the answer is yes switzerland is usually put forward but even that is not a pure full fledged no mitansha mitansh usa is not confederal it is federal i'm trying to make you the distinction between a confederal power and a federal power a confederation and the u u a federation so vikas and mitansh i don't think you got it correctly i was asking is there an example of a confederation and switzerland is often times put forward as one of the sole examples of confederation even that is not a pure example there are what we call cantons in switzerland switzerland is a multilingual country there's a german canton there's a bit of switzerland which is italian speaking there's a bit of it which speaks romance and bit of it which speaks french and all these different cantons have their legislative powers and they've given away a part of it to the central powers however in these modern times in the 21st century what you find is the emergence of stronger and stronger central and so there is the confederation is really an 18th century construct which barely exists so therefore should we treat ourselves as a federation and by the time our constituent assembly was discussing this matter we already have us and canada as important federal constitutions okay federations should we have a federation and that was really at the heart of the debate and as article 1 is already giving a hint of it 
federation itself was seen as too diffuse for indian purposes because it pits the central government and the state government more or less as co-equal and neither subordinate to the other and the preponderance of opinion in the constituent assembly is that we need a strong center and when this was the predominant please remember that our constituent assembly was already not just looking outside at other examples it also was dealing with the partition because the partition was raging as the constituent assembly was talking so if you if you throw your mind back it's in those extremely turbulent times that our constitution was being framed and certainly it had an impact on this great centralizing trend that you see in the constitution which was adopted eventually and what were these great centralizing trends i'm going to quickly 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 refer to some of these we've already seen that india opted not to have a strict separation of powers so i'm not going to go over that again but definitely we had a great uh, uh reason to have a not a strict federation but what the supreme court has called sometimes a quasi federal form of constitution when you read sr bommai what other phrases did you come across other than quasi federal i asked you to read this carefully the supreme court refers to it and has two three other phrases to use what are these other phrases amphibian truly good aman amphibian chief justice beg in state of rajasthan calls our constitution amphibian just look at it can you see the imagination like a frog which is comfortable in land and in water chief justice beg said we are amphibian sometimes we are unitary sometimes we are federal unitary meaning that there is only one government federal being that there are two so we morph and drift apart depending on the situation but other phrases used you know amphibian gives the impression that we morph and change sometimes unitary sometimes not quasi federal gives you another impression at all times we are neither federal nor are we purely unitary at all times it's not specific to a time you also come across a phrase organic federalism did anybody come across this phrase organic federalism can you tell me which was the judge that used that phrase so you must read the judgment very carefully okay don't read it when you're half asleep and just that's not the way to read a case if you read a case that way you are not going to get anything out of it into your head at all you read a case it's a very dense case you read it and you engage with it you will if you were reading it on your tablet or your phone or your computer you will be highlighting it you will be putting little speech bubbles and putting your comment if you are reading it with pen and paper it will be underlined it will be highlighted if you don't have highlights you don't have side comments my friend you have not read that judgment at all you wasted your time okay no waste your time you must read a judgment and in all the judgments that you will read in constitutional law i expect everybody to read it first thing off you will write a case brief or you will make your notes on paper up front you will put down the cause title let me just take a break and this is completely a rule don't come to my class unless you read all these things the way i have asked you to read if you've done internship in a good seniors office you would have written a case brief if you've not written a case brief don't moan about it just back up and do it don't i don't like students who say we were taught this you were taught this it's fine but half of law is self learned 
you will discipline yourself what is the cause title in any case any case very quickly let me just take two minutes off to do with this case brief what's the cause title in sr bombay please somebody quickly cause title in sr bombay's judgment sir bombay versus union of india <laughs> yes thank you that was a no brainer very quickly what is its citation you will then put down its citation what is the citation bab air 1994 supreme court 1918 that's true now why am i saying this i'm not saying that we must all become magus okay and magave but if you go into and listen to a senior advocate effortlessly they will tell you the citation of some of the key judgments okay it's one way of training your brain for memory a judge needs to have a tongue an ability to speak a judge uh, a lawyer needs to have an ability to speak a lawyer also needs to have a absolutely sharp memory and memory is like a muscle like without exercising you're not going to get your abs or your bicep or your tricep without trying to memorize and retain and commit to memory some things you are not going to be able to be a great lawyer you have to have the ability to speak without constantly referring to your notes it must have got internalized like that and when you are in law college and then university you have to exercise your you would have realized it by now that many of you are retaining a great deal more to do the intensity okay then after that you put this down okay tell me the quorum 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 quickly quickly not quorum as in q u o c o r a m okay not the final year students whom i can see in my class i want the second year students to answer please what's the quorum number of judges 7 Okay, the panel judges. Okay, what is the other word we use? Bench. Correct. Bench. The bench. Who are all on the bench? Okay, so who are on the bench? All of you have read S R Bombay. Who are on the bench? Justice Kajendra Gadkar. How would you? When I ask quorum first, what would you tell me? Before you start listing names, what is the first thing you would tell me if you were a junior trying to brief your senior advocate in the office? That it's a nine bench, yes, nine judge bench. Absolutely, the size of the bench is the first thing that you would tell me that it's a nine judge bench. Please try and intern in a, a senior's office. and seeing the way in which the juniors briefing or if you are in a uh, an office instructing counsel's office if you are lucky enough to go when they brief a senior counsel see how they brief everything where the senior will ask and you will say this paragraph sir what is the citation you will have it everything will be have you seen how they go in for briefing everything is in the fingertips Okay, nine judge bench. Okay, tell me the judges. Who wants to go and tell me all the judges? Justice Pandian, Justice Engadi, Justice Verma, Justice Kavan, Justice Ramaswamy, Justice Agarwal. I'm not forgotten the law. Uh, no, but no, no, I need somebody who tells me all nine. Aman, uh, I, I got eight. Uh, Justice Reddy, nine. Yeah, Justice Jeevan Reddy. The third thing that you're going to tell me after names is what? All I'm now on quorum only. First, you tell me the size. Then you tell me the names of all the judges. Okay. Then what is the third thing that you will tell me? M ratio of the bench. No, no, no. That's not what you're going to tell me. Ma'am, the accident accident or decision? Split. Split. Ma'am, the bench was headed by. Tell me how many judgments were delivered in the nine judge bench. For example, Keshwa Nanda Bharti, thirteen judges delivered amongst them eleven judgments. So these nine judges, how many judgments did they deliver? Find out. Okay, that's how you begin reading oh, that. Okay. 
Four. You sure? If you are telling me four, who was it who told me four? Pradeep. 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 Then tell me who wrote with who? Who spoke for himself and somebody else? You have to tell me that. Then. Oh, one sec, ma'am. I'll find out. If you have not read it, what I am trying to find out from you is the way in which you read a judgment. You must read it by saying. Justice Chalat wrote for himself, and Justice Chalat and Justice Broder. Or who wrote? Who spoke for whom? So that's the other thing that you will write. Okay. You're telling me, A. N. R. Dwivedi Ragini. Who? Which judges are you talking about? These are all judges, my dear. They're all very respectable people. They're not your classmates. So you would at least. Do me the favor of writing J J at the end of it, okay? Our judges are to be referred by justice or put J J. But are you talking about judges in the Keshwan and the Bharti case? Okay, fine. So when I come to quorum, you're going to tell me the size of the bench. You're going to look at the names of the judges and then how many people actually delivered judgments for themselves. After that, you put down the facts. After that, you will put down the arguments. Or uh, tell me another word for arguments, please. What is the word we normally contentions? Use? Yes, very good. Contentions, and you would put contentions for yeah, contentions for the plaintiff and the contention for the respondent. If it is an appeal case, petitioner and appellant, depending on. How you are going to do it, and then you come to the the decision of the case, and then you come to the ratio. So when we start with the judgment, it would have the ratio. It would also have the decision. And you know the distinction between ratio and decision, right? What's the distinction? What's the difference between ratio and decision? Ratio is the law of which it applies. I yeah, one of you please okay, Chandrika, please go ahead. Chandrika, I'm ratio. Ratio is what uh, the law which the judge has applied, and the decision is the the uh, verdict of the court uh, of the judge which came on the basis of that law. Okay, can anybody would like to express it slightly different? Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, uh, you can. Yeah, you can tell me. Ma'am, ratio is the part of the ma'am. Uh, uh, basically, judgment. What is it? Ma'am, ratio is operational part. Ma'am, operational part. Operational part. What do we mean? Yes, yeah, Neha. Another way. Yes, ma'am. Ratio is the ratio behind the judgment. Okay. And decision is the decision of judges. And ratio is something different than the uh, decision. Okay. So the decision is not on a point of law. The decision is composed of the facts. Which are in yeah. contention in that particular case. So the decision speaks to the specific facts of that particular case and disposes of the uh, the, the the legal problem or the list that came before the court in that particular case. Whereas the ratio are the broad principles of law or the reasoning behind that particular. decision right so the ratio is the reasoning decision is specific to the fact what uh, chandrika mentioned as the verdict okay but normally we use the word verdict when it comes to criminal law okay but the decision is more generic okay look i took 5 minutes but when you read a particular judgment whatever be the branch of law normally if you were to write a case brief you would write uh, one page on something like this And initially, add law students. It's worthwhile that exercise because then you will feel more in command of it. So, in my tutorial classes, I'm going to start having students present the case, and I would like them to very quickly present contentions of the appellant, contention of the respondent, and then you come to the. Sorry, I forgot in the beginning itself the issues, the issues over which the judgment is given. So you would have the course title, you would have the citation, you would have the quorum, then you would have the facts, then you would have the contentions, then you would have the issue, then you would have your the judgment which comprises both the ratio and the decision. Okay. 
Now, you can go into further details. How do I find out the ratio of the case? How do I find out is it the ratio of the case or not? If you went into, uh, there's a great judgment that Justice uh, Sanjay Krishnan Paul gave this last month in the Supreme Court where he applied the rule of inversion to find out what is the ratio on the precedent in a particular case. So there are many ways in which you could find out the precedent. I know you studied all of this in first year, so please, I'm not going to do I'm going to go on my class. So, I'm sorry, please uh, name the judgment that my dear friend Aman, I've given you this much. The task of a researcher is to find out what it is. Okay? You are going to find out all these things. Okay? And look and try and locate where Justice Sanjay Kishan Paul did to the rule of inversion for finding out the seat. This is good enough what I've told you. Bias towards the center. So I was talking about amphibian. I was talking about organic federalism. I was talking about bias towards the center. Now, when you have read the SR Bomai case, you will realize why the Supreme Court felt that our constitution was not purely federal. And I'm going to very, very, very quickly going to ask, because I also need to take attendance, but since I'm going into lunch hour, I'm going to take another five minutes for attendance. But before that, I'm going to continue with my class. There are many provisions of the article of the Constitution which SR Bomai judgment refers to to explain why we are not a federation and why we are a quasi-amphibian, blah, 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 blah. Which explains why Article 1 finally chooses to describe us as a union of states and not a federation. So I'm going to do two judgments to explain why we are a union and not a federation. The first is the SR Bombay. The second is State of West Bengal versus Union of India. But that is going to come in another class. Today I'm still on SR Bombay. What are the provisions of the constitution which the Supreme Court refers to to explain why we are not a pure federation, but we are quasi-federal. Anybody can begin who has read the SR for my judgment. Ma'am, 352, uh, emergency provision, ma'am. Okay, so don't tell me individual, tell me groups of, so emergency. So who was that who said emergency? Am I? Oh, Yugal. But Yugal, you've already spoken. So your quota in my class is over. I want somebody who's not spoken. What part of the emergency provisions makes us quasi-federal and not federal? Would anybody else like to speak? Otherwise, I'll go back to you. No, Article 356. Uh, so why is it quasi-federal and not federal? What about 356? President can impose em emergency on the states. And therefore, what makes it quasi-federal? Um, it makes uh, the unity, the structure uh, of the government unity. It, because the central government then exercises sometimes legislative power and executive power over matters relating to states, right? Executive yes, power, yes. And what we need to find out is whether the center can or central parliament can even make laws for the states, in which case central legislative power also gets taken over the state legislative power. Okay, so the bunch of emergency provisions, one is 356, popularly known as President's Group. Any other aspect of emergency that gives you the bias towards the center, somebody else? Uh, Ma'am, the governor is appointed by the centre okay. and uh, he's the one who, gives, uh, who tells the president whether there's a situation for um, declaring emergency. Okay, fine. Okay, so the appointment of the president is not, uh, of the governor is done by the president. President operates under central aid and advice and therefore there is this broad overlapping between center and state. They are not independent. Okay. Then, ma'am. Ma yeah, somebody has not spoken before. Ma I can't. You have not spoken before. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, Ma'am, in uh, even in uh, section Article three fifty five, it is mentioned that union has to see that are, are the states are governed by the procedure coordinates with the law. 
okay fine so the power to give directions the duty to protect and the duty of the center to see that the constitutional machinery is conducted in procedures uh, as per the constitution provisions fine fine is there anything else in emergency before we move on anything else that shows us that we have a bias towards the center ma'am single citizenship no no emergency i'm on emergency okay so let's keep that on hold now let's come to the legislative power between center and states what are those provisions in the constitution that the sr by my judgment talks about which are examples of the quasi federal nature of the okay 360 financial emergency why uh, samiksha you've put down article 360 in financial emergency what is the quasi federal nature of 360 Uh, Ma'am, there the financial control moves over to the sector. Okay, fine. Thank you. Okay. Now let's come to the legislative powers. Is there anything you want to tell me between to Article two forty nine to two fifty three? That's going to be our uh, third or fourth topic for sure. But those of you who have read it, what between articles two forty nine to three two fifty three? Those four five articles. Can you just quickly run me through and tell me why these are quasi-federal? Yes, ma'am. Who is the editor of the Assam Shikis? Ma'am, Article Two Forty Nine, when Rajya Sabha has power to make laws for states, and uh, because Rajya Sabha represents the states, so do you need consent of the states to make this law? Uh, exactly. I think. Yes. Yes. I'm not sure. Okay, no uh, problem. And two fifty. What is about two fifty? Ma'am, emergency in state parliament make laws. Two fifty one. Somebody else can also speak. Samiksha Gupta, you have your mic on. Uh, ma'am, if uh, there are two or more states who request the center to make a law on a common subject, so that entitles the union to make the law. Two fifty one or two fifty two. Uh, ma'am, I'm not sure about the article. Why isn't your constitution open in front of you? Not two fifty two. Open, but I'm not two fifty two. Because it is by consent and adoption of such legislation by any other. Ah, uh, no, no, no. Somebody else tell me about two fifty three, two fifty. No, no, no. Oh, you girl, I'm, I'm not that I don't want to hear you, you girl. Um, but I want more people to speak, not Sakshi, not Samiksha. Somebody who's not spoken. Uh, Akshay uh, Kumar Yadav, thank you. Okay, don't uh, take offense, but I want more students to speak. Akshay, yes, go ahead. What is the article two fifty three? Yeah. Under Article two fifty three, the center has the power to to make to give effect to any international agreement which is which the government signs. So, give me an example. Uh, land boundary agreement with uh, recent uh, land boundary agreement with Bangladesh. Okay, we'll be coming to that under Article three. uh take another example for example we decided in uh, in the gat or we decide uh, in the trips that we are not going to give subsidy for agriculture or that land will be distributed in this way now land is a state subject but still because of article 253 it will be only parliament that can make a law so 253 takes away and collapses list 1 list 2 and list 3 and makes everything as if it was list 1 so for the purposes of giving effect to any foreign treaty list 2 completely vanishes the power to make law is only there with the center so you have a bunch of articles like this which veer and then there's a third bunch of articles which is article 1 2 3 and 4 which is actually that first unit that i'm going to have that sort of begun that is the power of parliament to redraw the boundaries of a state to increase the boundary of the state and to take away the boundaries of a state or reduce this again is a great central power which is there fourth part is dealing with fundamental rights chapter during emergency your rights under article 19 can be curbed and this right is given once again to central parliament so When you read S. R. Bhumai's judgment, the judgments are giving you examples of 
parts or chapters of the constitution where in normal circumstances we are operating as a federal constitution but in certain times it overrides the another set of examples that i can take is river waters river water is an entry in list 2 rivers however do not recognize political state boundaries those rivers merely flow through states they don't recognize political borders they go in the way that the river wants to flow so if there is an interstate river water dispute then under article 262 it is the power of parliament to make a law with regard to interstate river waters to refer it to a tribunal so there are many examples that the sr bombay judgment shows you where there is a normal time and then there's an abnormal time but there are also examples of the sr bombay judgment shows you that even in normal time state powers are limited and there are powers of the centra greater so one is an emergency type of situation other is that even in normal times there is a greater bias towards the center so you will see when you read the judgment i want you to keep note of the bias what um, you know um, justice jeevan reddy calls the bias of the constitution towards the center exists not only in emergency or in extraordinary circumstances in the normal circumstances also there is this bias towards the center so all of this put together explains to you why the constituent assembly felt that neither the word federation nor the word confederation would be apt and we went with the word of union but union may have conveyed that we were unitary which also we were not they were also going to be state governments which had power and therefore the ultimate compromise union of states union of states that is there is a place for states they do have their independent power but we are not a federation in many ways we have this amphibian nature there is this bias and therefore the ultimate compromise union of states what i would like you all to do is for tomorrow is my tutorial class okay. and i am going to only take up state of west bengal versus union of india i'm not going to teach i'm going to go through state of west bengal versus union of india exactly in the manner in which i outlined my case paper i am going to call on whomever i wish to tell me the cause title to the facts to the contention to the ratio and to the decision i want you all to read the extracts of this judgment it's just a five page judgment my tutorial class is going to be on this i want everybody to come prepared and be present okay and now i'm going to stop and i am going to go Thank you for waiting patiently, and I am going to do. Oh, uh, ma'am. Yeah. Ma'am, why we added unity and integrity of the nation in uh, by forty seven amendment when we needed the post post partition? Okay. Um, let me give you a quick reply now, and maybe I'll give you a longer reply when I come to articles one to nine. because it could not be fair to keep everybody told that they are my quick answer is that implicit in articles 1 2 3 and 4 is the sovereign right to take land and give away land but the need to emphasize unity and integrity of india was not dealing with sovereign power but to say that the borders are inviolate and it also comes up at the same time that india ratified with reservation the international covenant on civil and political rights and the international covenant on economic social and cultural rights and the reservations that we entered into regarding the right of secession 
I'm not going to say more than this because I'll speak more about it when I come to one, two, three, and four. But I think that that was the background in which the Forty Second Amendment came about: secession and uh, India entering into those two international covenants. Okay. So whoever asked that question, that's all because I don't want to delay. Okay. So I want to actually complete part of the preamble and move on to Article One today. Now, in our preamble, the we spent a couple of classes looking at it. I just want to begin with one so that I can go ahead. Uh, if you look at that word fraternity, which is where I think we stopped last time, we were looking at. Justice. We were looking at liberty. We were looking at equality. We noticed that words like liberty, equality, fraternity coming to us really from uh, the French Revolution, and we also looked at uh, justice, which is of course not there in the French Revolution. It's something that we placed very high up, and it's come even above the. Liberty, equality, and fraternity, because I think the freedom movement reflected the need for justice, the need to do away with the, and to create a more equal society. So you can see the close links between equality and justice. And next semester, when we come to the chapter on fundamental rights, I think we will see the conceptual relations between justice and equality greater. I pointed out to you that while the French Revolution of 1789 uh, underscored equality. The Americans, in their declaration of independence, dropped that word equality, and you will see that there is a definite need, reason why they dropped equality because the growing capitalist economy was not very concerned with questions of equality. But when you cut and come straight away to the mid 40s. Post Second World War and all the constitutions that are there, you will see that justice is now coming forward as a very great demand that is being put forward by all the newly emerging countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And so, justice has always been. If you look at early uh, biblical thought, justice has always been what was called a cardinal virtue: prudence, temperance. Fortitude and justice, the four great cardinal virtues, which highly celebrated in the Bible as important virtues that we should have. And in fact, many uh, jurists, for example, uh, John Rawls, when he wrote his book Theory of Justice, he said, "Amongst all, justice is the foremost value amongst all the." Social institutions that exist, you know, far more than liberty, equality, and fraternity, and and I think that that thinking was very, very strong. The Indian Constitution is far prior to John Rawls' writing of his theory of justice, uh, and uh, you know, justice was given a pride of place. Now I come to fraternity, and then you look fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual. We were, I think we stopped there last class. And the unity and integrity of the nation. The forty-second amendment added these words: unity and integrity. Now, in my previous class, I had mentioned to you that whether the preamble was to be a part of the constitution, and if it was, it was capable of amendment. The Keshwananda Bharati case clearly told. दोस्तों ब्राज ग्रुप आशा करता है कि आप सभी लोगों को ये लेसन पसंद आया होगा आप अपना फीडबैक कमेंट बॉक्स में देना न भूलें थैंक्स फॉर वाचिंग